Thank you very much, uh, Ilaria. And I will move on uh, with my uh, presentation. <clears throat> the main goal of my research has been to trace the possible influence of Origen's commentary on the Epistle to the Romans in Augustine's and Sabrian writings from the period uh, 411 until 418. So my focus has been the notion of freedom, broadly understood, in Augustine's interpretation of Romans and certain elements of exegesis from Origen's commentary that might have inspired the Bishop of Hippo. In this presentation, I would like to provide a general overview uh, of my work, as well as a more detailed case study of a particular text from Origen's commentary that might have inspired uh, Augustine. The general overview and the case study take up the first and second parts of my talk. In the third and last part of the presentation, I'll offer a few remarks on the potential contemporary significance of my research topic. At the, uh, at the core of our common project in the Innovative Training uh, net Network, uh, our ITN, lies a perceived dichotomy between two rival conceptions of human freedom inherent in the Christian tradition, one claiming origin as a notable representative and the other favoring the views of the mature Augustine. <clears throat> Within this framework of understanding, the Originian, Originian current in the tradition emphasizes that human beings are free to think, decide, and act in accordance with their own inner motivations. The Augustinian current, on the other hand, underlines the negative consequences of sin in human life and emphasizes instead the severe restrictions on freedom uh, in our earthly life. While this general characterization of the differences between Origins and Augustine's views of human freedom is certainly not without justification, I believe that there's a need for certain uh, nuances. The fact that Augustine appears to have borrowed exegetical elements and arguments from Rufinus of Aquileia's Latin translation of Origen's commentary on Romans does not seem to fit the notion that Origen and Augustine represent, present us with totally incompatible views of human freedom. If this were indeed the case, one would certainly not expect Augustine to use Origen's commentary positively as a resource against his arch enemy Pelagius and his alleged faulty understanding of Christian anthropology and human freedom. In order to give an overview of my work, it would be convenient, but hopefully not too boring for you, uh, to, to briefly go through the contents of my PhD dissertation. In my first chapter, I give an introduction to the complicated issues related to Rufinus' reliability as a translator of the commentary. Uh, of the Greek works of Origen, with special emphasis on his Latin translation of the commentary on Romans. Thankfully, a few Greek fragments of the, of the original commentary have been preserved, and it's therefore possible to compare Rufinus' translation with the Greek uh, original. I give a comparison of Rufinus' section on Paul's phrase, set apart for the gospel of God, segregatus in Evangelium Dei, in Romans chapter 1, verse 1 for which we have a parallel Greek text in the work known as the Philokalia from the fourth century. This passage is not only interesting with respect to judging the quality of Rufinus' translation, but the theme is also highly relevant for my purposes, um, since it deals with the question of, yeah, of, of, of human freedom. <clears throat> uh, while, the Lat but while the Latin text does not display any of the philosophical sophistication uh, that we find in origin, uh, Origen's original uh, commentary. It faith, quite faithfully reproduces uh, the, the main point of what Origen wanted to say, in this case at least. Both Origen himself and Rufinus' Latin commentary clearly state that Paul was not elected by God in an arbitrary fashion. Rather, God in his foreknowledge already saw beforehand that Saul of Tarsus had the potential to become a great apostle and that he freely would contribute with his own efforts. On the basis of this information about the future, God therefore elected Paul in a manner that did not override his individual freedom. In the second and fourth chapters, I bri briefly examine the principles of interpretation which underlie respectively origins and Augustine's understanding of the epistle to the Romans. In the third chapter, 
Raik Salmon, who finances translation of audience commentary from the perspective of questions related to human freedom. Already in his preface to the commentary, Origen states that he seeks to refute certain heretical interpretations of Romans, which try to turn the Apostle Paul into a proponent of determinism on the basis of certain passages in this letter. I try to show that issues related to human freedom take up a good portion of the commentary and that Origen actually fulfills his ambition that he sets out in the preface. <clears throat> in the fifth chapter, I finally embark on the reception study in that I make a comparison of Augustine's early interpretation of Romans from the 390s with the exegesis found in Origen's Latin commentary. While there are a couple of curious parallel ideas between the two uh, already at this early stage, I argue that they all can be accounted for without invoking direct reception of Origen's commentary uh, by Augustine as an explanation. According to the um, traditional dating uh, of the work, um, um, as uh, uh, Ilaria has already mentioned, Rufinans already published, only published his Latin translation of the commentary in 405 or 406. It would therefore be surprising to encounter allusions to it in Augustine's works uh, prior to this time. The parallels between Augustine's exegesis of Romans and Origen's commentary will become much more striking and numerous when we study his Antipelagian writings from the four, early 410s, four that is roughly 15 years later. In the sixth chapter, chapter of my dissertation, I examine the parallels that have already been highlighted in the previous scholarship, in addition to a few of my own. The most convincing of these possible instances of reception of Origen's commentary has to do with the interpretation of the passage, Romans chapter 5, um, verses 12 to 21, which was of crucial importance to Augustine's doctrine, his famous doctrine of original sin. Augustine seems to have found exegetical inspiration in certain arguments from Origen's commentary, which implicate all human beings in the transgression of Adam in the Garden of Eden. In addition to examples of a positive reception, we also find Augustine tacitly correcting Origen's exegesis of Romans on a couple of points. <clears throat> I have found that the case for reception in some cases is less clear cut than the previous scholarship might seem to suggest. Given the many different sources that plausibly could have inspired or provoked Augustine, it is not always possible to say with, with confidence that he is drawing inspiration from or reacting against Origen's commentary in particular uh, in each case. It could be that he is reacting to Ambrosiaster's interpretation of Romans or Pelagius' um, uh, instead. Despite these caveats, I believe that the most plausible explanation of the parallels between Augustine's exegesis of Romans in his Antipelagian writings and in the in, in other, in other in Psalmos is that he, at this time, in the early 410s, has studied Rufinus's translation firsthand and subsequently employed arguments uh, and ideas from it in his own works. But yeah, uh, with, without mentioning uh, his source, of course. In my seventh chapter, I show that many of the possible instances of reception are repeated in Augustine's subsequent writings from 413 to 418. Several of these elements thus became trusted uh, weapons in Augustine's anti-Pelagian uh, arsenal, so to say. Augustine's anti-Pelagian argumentation is somewhat repetitive, and, and the same goes for his, uh, the, the, the elements from Origen's commentary that he appears to uh, be borrowing. Uh, he, he doesn't really add much to his, um, to his uh, arguments as, as, as the, the controversy uh, progressed. <clears throat> as far as I've been able to ascertain. In my eighth and final chapter, I compare Augustine's perception of Origen's commentary with Pelagius' use of the same work in his uh, Expositiones on Romans. This comparison clearly reveals the, t the tendentious nature of both Augustine's and Pelagius' perception of the commentary. Their preconceived theological views and their polemical agenda to a great extent determined which elements of Origen's exegesis of Romans which they took inspiration from. This fact is perhaps most evident in the exegesis of Romans chapter 5, verse 12, 
On his side, Pelagius appears to have borrowed elements from Origen's commentary that emphasizes his idea of uh, his theory of imitation, imitatio, that is, that human beings inherit Adam's sin in that we uh, follow his bad example uh, when we sin. Augustine, on the other hand, seems to have borrowed an element of Origen's exegesis of Romans 5.12 which emphasizes that we are born with an inherently sinful nature owing to Adam's transgression. I'll now briefly examine a possible example of Augustine borrowing material from Origen's commentary on Romans in order to support his own theological views. In his comments on Romans chapter 4, verses 16 to 17, Origen somewhat surprisingly argues that human faith itself should be viewed as a gift of God's grace. And I'll, yeah, I'll read this long uh, quote uh, for you. <clears throat> for to give an example, just as my, I might say that we exist, this cannot be understood to mean that we exist as a wage for our works. Plainly, it is a gift of God that we exist. It is the grace of the Creator who willed us to exist. In this way as well, if we receive, receive the inheritance of God's promises, it is the wage of divine grace and not of any debt or work. Now, it might perhaps appear that what is said to be of faith is not by grace, since if a person must first offer his faith, grace this has to be merited from God. But listen to what the same apostle teaches about this as well, elsewhere about this as well. For in the passage where he lists the gifts of the Spirit, which he says are given to believers according to the measure of their faith, he asserts that the gift of faith as well is granted along with the other gifts through the Holy Spirit. For after many words, he speaks of it in this way, to another faith is given by the same Spirit, in order to show that even faith is given through grace. Moreover, elsewhere the same apostle teaches this when he says, for it has been granted to you from God, not only that you believe in Christ, but also that you should suffer for his sake. You find this point out also, also pointed out in the Gospels, where the apostles, once understanding that the faith which is only human, cannot be perfected unless that which comes from God should be added to it. Say to the Savior, increase our faith. Uh, end of quote. <clears throat> from the viewpoint of Augustine, the cited passage from the Commentary on Romans must have seemed like gefundenes fressen, as the Germans would call it, as it could appear to um, refute the Pelagian claim that faith depends on a free decision that human beings can choose to take or not to take. Origen's strong insistence that even faith is to be understood as a divine gift could seem to suggest that human beings can do absolutely nothing to merit, merit this gift. It would therefore be, not be surprising if we could detect some inspiration from Origen on Augustine, Augustine's Antipolitian writings on this particular point. Let us compare Origen's argument with a passage from Augustine's work, De Gestis Pelagi. <clears throat> and I quote, was it we ourselves that gave it, that is faith to us? Did we ourselves make ourselves faithful? I must by all means say here emphatically, it is he who has made us and not we ourselves. And indeed nothing else than this is pressed upon us in the apostles' teaching when he, that is Paul, says, For I declare through the grace that is given to, unto me to everyone that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. Hence, too, arises the well-known challenge, what do you have that you did not receive? Inasmuch as we have received even that which is the spring from which everything we have of good in our action takes its beginning. And now I have another uh, similar sounding uh, passage from the subsequent treatise, De Gratia Christi et de Peccato Originali, <laughs> but uh, in, in also uh, not to, to tire you too much, I, I, I won't read it, but just um, uh, yeah, uh, mention that the, the, the important thing here is that Augustine, he, he adds the, the, um, the verse, from Philipp, uh, verse from Philippians, chapter one, verse 29. Uh, that we also uh, find so in, in Origen's uh, commentary to support this notion that uh, faith is a, is a divine gift. <clears throat> <clears throat> 
I find Augustine's argument for faith as a divine gift strikingly similar, similar to what we read in Origen's uh, commentary. Both authors compare the gift of faith to the gift of existence, as we have seen. Augustine makes this point through his citation from the Psalms. It is he who has made us, and not we ourselves. Human beings cannot take any credit for the fact that we exist, since our existence is to be ascribed to an act of God. Therefore, it would obviously be absurd to claim that we exist as a reward for something good that we have done prior to our very existence. Both Origen and Augustine state that human faith, faith should be understood in a similar manner. Even human faith cannot be understood as an autonomous merit by which we earn God's grace. Faith itself is actually a gift which God gives us. Curiously, this argument is supported by two identical biblical passages by Origen and Augustine. Romans chapter 12, verses 3 and 6, and Philippians chapter 1, verse 29. In Romans chapter 12, verse 3, Paul says that God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. And shortly afterwards, in Romans 12, 6, he adds that God grants spiritual gifts to human beings according to the measure of our faith. In Philippians 1.29, Paul writes that for, for, for to you it has been granted on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake. These texts could be taken to imply that believing in Christ is something which God simply grants to human beings. If my suspicion is correct, that Augustine found inspiration in Origen's argument for faith as a divine gift, it would also be no, uh, worth noting the aspects that he chose not to repeat. As we saw in the passage I quoted from the commentary on Romans, Origen makes a significant reference to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 17, uh, verse 5, where the apostles ask Christ to increase their faith. On the basis of this text, Origen says that our own defective human faith can only be perfected with the help of divine grace. This comment could seem to imply that the faith which human beings themselves offer is not completely uh, worthless. It could sound like this faith, no matter how defective it is, is actually a precondition for receiving the superior faith which comes as a gift from God. This aspect of Origen's teaching must have seemed somewhat problematic from the perspective of Augustine. In his polemic against Pelagius and his followers, he consistently tried to demonstrate that, that faith itself is not the result of an, an autonomous choice on the part of human beings. It should therefore not be, surpri would therefore not be surprising if Augustine passed this aspect of Origen's teaching over in silence, if he found insp inspiration in the passage which I have quoted. Augustine's reception of Origen's commentary provides us with a mirror that reflects the theological concerns which inf informed his reading of Paul's epistle to the Romans. Unsurprisingly, I found no evidence to suggest that Augustine was inspired by Origen's attempts at reconciling the notion of human free choice with divine foreknowledge and predestination, as we find it expressed in several passages in the commentary on Romans. Origen's explanatory model, which sees, sees divine predestination uh, as being based on foreknowledge of human faith or merits, was already was, uh, rejected by Augustine decisively in his early work at Simplicianum. And in the course of the Pelagian controversy, he only sought to combat such a view. There are, however, other ways in which Origen's view of human freedom, as transmitted by Rufinus in the Latin commentary, can be said to have inspired Augustine. A common denominator for many of the possible instances of reception is that these elements of exegesis seem to serve to restrict human freedom in one way or another. Augustine is happy to follow Origen's interpretation of Romans whenever he grants that complete freedom is not attainable in this earthly life, owing to the negative influence of sin. In particular, the harmful consequences of Adam's transgression inhibit the freedom of his descendants. Certain statements in the commentary were appealing to Augustine 
because they could be used in support of his preconceived notion of original sin. If Augustine's understanding of faith as a divine gift is also inspired by Origen's commentary, as I have argued, this element also serves to limit our freedom in that human beings are not capable of believing in Christ without divine assistance. Despite the particular philosophical and theological underpinnings of the discussion of freedom that we encounter in Origins and Augustine's interpretations of Romans, I believe that many of the questions they had to face are still relevant today, and many of the, the, of the answers are still blowing uh, in the wind. For instance, the question of Adam's transgression and its consequences for humankind might appear obsolete and outdated to many modern or postmodern people. But underneath the surface, we encounter issues of a universal significance. For, for example, how strong an influence do one's inborn nature and upbringing have on our behavior? Are even significant existential and moral uh, choices in our lives completely determined by factors outside of our own control? Or is there some room for the capacity that has traditionally been called free will? Is it possible to overcome destructive bad habits that with, which threaten to take control over, over us, even against our will? Discussions related to such important questions can, in my view, find a wealth of inspiration and resources in the writing of, writings of both Origen and Augustine. Thank you for your attention.